Hey guys, and welcome to the Working Money Channel. I've got JC Collins here on Twitter, and he is posting a Flare Networks update. This is the full suite of planned Flare Finance products, which will be launched on both the Songbird Network and on the Flare Networks. As value flows into the ecosystem, this suite of DeFi products will be one of the core dApps on both networks. So guys, built on the XRPL, the Flare Networks is opening up uh, Flare Mining, Flare Wrap, uh, Flare X, Flare Loans, Flare Mutual, Flare Farm, Flare Drops, and this is all happening on the APY Cloud. They they also have uh, Flare Scan. This, these are some of the products in the ecosystem and DeFi Oracles. So just uh, giving you a bit of a snapshot on what is being developed on the Flare Networks. It's also going to be available on Songbird. So uh, if you're still holding your Songbird tokens and uh, you know awaiting your Spark tokens, you will be able to participate in these networks and uh, you will ultimately be a part of helping develop the XRP ledger. So just a bit of an update there from JC Collins. Wanted to thank him for posting that. I also saw this guy's from you today. So apparently uh, XRP validators start voting on NFT related amendments. Emi Yoshikawa, Ripple's Vice President of Corporate Strategy and Operations, has announced that XRP validators have started voting on the XLS20 amendments, uh, which would enable native non-fungible tokens. At least 80% of them have to vote in favor of the proposal. And I believe uh, there was a recent update that uh, we did get over 80%. Uh, uh, over a two-week period in order to ensure its passage at press time seven validators brex.io bitso and others have voted against the proposal last may ripple x invited developers to provide feedback and in january it released an nft devnet making it possible for developers to play around with native nft capabilities and for more information about the xls standard what that is uh i do believe i did a video on that i will link it up here if i can find one for you guys the xls standard has such built-in features as auctioning and minting simplifying the process of creating NFTs. Last month, Ripple formed a partnership with Web3 firm Crosstower in order to display XRPL-powered NFTs on its marketplace. And so the NFT sector is currently in the middle of a massive crisis with open seas trading volume collapsing by 99%. Because NFTs do not have um, the utility and the value, I suppose, uh, that one sees today in them, um, they're not as popular as they were during the mass hysteria FOMO portion of 2021. But guys, I think they're really going to ramp up again, and I think this is why Ripple is now poised and ready to take a chunk of that particular sector within the cryptocurrency realm. So just posting an update here, guys, from the blockchain backer, uh, the 14-day clock starts today for NFTs on the XRP ledger, and so this is happening on September the 13th. Validator votes have exceeded 80%, sitting at 82.86% in favor of the XLS20 amendment. So 82.6%. We got the amount. Uh, I believe this was probably published before that uh, reached that. So there's the update there. Wanted to thank uh, the blockchain backer just for posting that. We've also got this guy's from the Wrath of Kahneman. If you need it, Ripple partner Lulu Exchange is opening three more branches in the UAE. So now the total is up to 89 branches. UAE's premier cross-border payments company Lulu Exchange today opened three new branches in the country to zip past the 250 global branch count of its present company, Lulu Financial Group. They had a ceremony and uh, speaking at the ceremony, ceremony was Dr. Aman Puri. Uh, he's the managing director over there. He said, I am delighted to be part of this momentous occasion that celebrates the eventful journey of Lulu Financial Holdings. The company's network of Lulu Exchange branches in the UAE, coupled with its digital innovations, have positively influenced the remittance and currency exchange sector in many ways. I wish the team the very best on their ambitious journey to further disrupt the space. So uh, Lulu Exchange partnered with Ripple, opening up three more branches, the United Arab Emirates in the Middle East, a very Ripple friendly region of the world. So we've been seeing tons of expansion over there over the last year or so. And uh, Lulu Exchange, one of those bigger Ripple enabled partners, taking the opportunity, leveraging the benefits of RippleNet and, uh, you know, pursuing what they're seeing as a positive business growing endeavor. So interesting news there coming out of the UAE and Lulu Exchange wanted to thank the Wrath of Kahneman just for posting that. And here's another one, guys, from Mike Manfield here on Twitter with regards to Ripple Partner ACI, EFT Corporation, the African-focused fintech provider specializing in end-to-end -end payment solutions, today announced a new partnership with Ripple Partner ACI Worldwide to protect their customers from fraud. So as part of a deal, EFT will roll out ACI's fraud management solution across all Eastern and South African countries, which includes Kenya, Ethiopia, Uganda, uh, Tanzania, Rwanda, Burundi, Zimbabwe, Zambia, Malawi, Botswana, and Mauritius. The ACI fraud solution is platform agnostic and monitors all channels, meaning it can monitor and protect across web, mobile, ATM, and POS platforms. The solution will enable banks, acquirers, processors, and networks to turn fraud prevention into a competitive differentiator with a secure and seamless solution 
solution that exceeds customer expectations and delivers against increasing regulatory demands. And here's a quote, guys, from Jerry Shukul, senior commercial lead at ACI Worldwide. He says ACI Worldwide and EFT Corporation have been working together over the past 20 years to provide incredible experiences to consumers across Africa. This includes working on our five national switches and partnering with over 30 major customers across the continent. We're excited to roll out our fraud management solution to strengthen the security and capability of our network, protecting customers and our improving services. So more Ripple Partner news here, guys, expanding into uh, the prevention of fraud. Doesn't say anything about blockchain technology down here, but it is a, a Ripple Partner, so who knows? Maybe with more verticals being developed on the XRPL, maybe one day we will see this service running on the XRPL. Anyway, I wanted to thank Mike Manfield there for pointing that out. Uh, I also saw this guy's another Ripple Partner, Flutterwave. They are moving ahead with an IPO despite woes in Kenya. So Flutterwave, they've been in some hot water recently, but uh, you know they are pursuing an IPO a public offering. They've also been quite successful in Africa. So African fintech Flutterwave is moving ahead with preparations for their IPO on the NASDAQ despite claims of financial impropriety by the Central Bank of Kenya and its bank accounts being frozen by Kenya's high court. Wow trouble. <laughs> we have the attractive market potential and opportunity to do so. This coming from uh, Chief Financial Officer O'Neill Bambani. Uh, this is what he told Bloomberg uh, yesterday. We are a growth company and we have a tremendous opportunity to invest and really develop solutions for the largest enterprises in the world that transact in Africa. Flutterwave is planning to use the proceeds from the public listing to grow its operations in current markets while exploring expansion into new African opportunities. Uh, this coming from Bloomberg. Bambani came to Flutterwave in June from American Express, along with three other executives. So they're trudging ahead moving forward, despite the fact that they are uh, in hot water with the Central Bank of Kenya. Clearly, Flutterwave has been uh, benefiting from utilizing RippleNet. They have expanded in Africa quite a bit. And so uh, this is just the latest update on that. And so guess what's happening in October of 2022? The LIBOR rate is coming to an end. And why is this important? Well, because there is the possibility that a digital currency, a global digital payment currency, could influence the new rate. They've talked about it. Here are some of the pieces of the puzzle that point to the fact that it could maybe even be XRP. So this from Digital Perspectives here on Twitter. One of the main architects is the SOFOR rate, which will replace the LIBOR rate, guys. And uh, for those of you guys who do not know, this is going to be revised on October 25th, 2022. Here is just a clip. Uh, somebody took a photo of the notice. We're writing to inform you about some upcoming changes to your Kaliba Club account that we are required to make because the LIBOR index we currently use and calculate your annual percentage rate or APR is being discontinued and will no longer be available. This notice provides a summary of changes that will be made to your account terms. These changes will take effect on October 25th, 2022. And so maybe I should back up a little bit. Um, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself here. For those of you guys who do not know, the LIBOR rate is the basic rate of interest used in lending between banks on the London interbank market and also used as a reference for setting the interest rate on other loans. The London interbank offered rate is an interest rate average calculated from estimates submitted by the leading banks in London. And so each bank estimates what it would be charged uh, were it to borrow from other banks. The resulting average rate is usually abbreviated to LIBOR or LIBOR or more officially to ICE LIBOR. Well, this rate, guys, is getting replaced. Enter SOFOR. So this is the secured overnight financing rate uh, and is secured by interbank overnight interest rates. SOFOR is a reference rate established as an alternative to LIBOR. LIBOR has been published in a number of currencies and underpins financial contracts from all over the world. And uh, so just to give you guys some more context here, how is it different? The main difference between SOFOR and LIBOR is how the rates are produced. While well, LIBOR is based on panel bank input, so far is a broad measure of the cost of borrowing cash overnight collateralized by U.S. Treasury securities in the repurchase agreement. And so back to this tweet here, some more data explaining what is happening. Why are you changing the way my variable APRs are calculated? And it just goes in to mention the LIBOR rate as well. Uh, this has been a commonly used index. However, LIBOR is expected to be discontinued by June 2023. So government regulators have asked that lenders stop using it as soon as possible. The simplest way to sum up the change is that the LIBOR index rate is changing, guys. And again, October 25th, 2022, that is the date. Now, for the Ripple connection here, Sandy O'Connor, a board member from Ripple. And as Cowboy Crypto down here points out, she's also on the board of BNY Mellon. 
Tim Keeney, who is vice chairman and chief executive officer, investment services at BNY Mellon for 17 years, is also the vice chair at PolySign, which is another interesting connection here. So why does this all matter? Well, Sandy O'Connor, board of Ripple, in this video she discusses the switch from LIBOR, $300 trillion in financial contracts from derivatives to corporate credit lines to so for Federal Reserve's preferred replacement. And the deadline switch at that time was December 31st, 2021. Here she is down here, guys, discussing this. A video courtesy of Nathan Price on Twitter. Let me play you guys this real quick. Is now used. Anyone want to guess for how many, <clears throat> how many uh, in notional values? $200 trillion are referenced off of the U.S. dollar LIBOR rate. How many transactions do you think happens in each day on average in three months, which is the busiest one? Any guesses? Five trades. Five trades are happening on average every single day. It is the biggest inverted triangle you've ever seen. On average, its total value is about $500 million. Houston, do we have a problem? $200 trillion off of 500 million. So how does LIBOR get calculated? Well, you've got these panel banks that submit what they think LIBOR is, and it's supposed to be transactions-based. Well, if there are only five transactions and there are 16 tra pa panel banks, not enough transactions to go around, my friends. So in fact, they have to use expert judgment. And therein is the instability of the rate. There is an awful lot of risk to use expert judgment on setting a rate for $200 trillion. So that's not really very good. So what did we do? Well, first thing, if you're going to transition away from something, what do you need? Something to go to. Um, so this public-private partnership that is has in place with public policymakers set up by the, the Federal Reserve Board, the Fed, the CFTC, the U.S. Treasury, OFR, um, we came to the table to identify a new risk-free rate as an alternative to LIBOR for use in derivatives. And we came up with this rate called the Secured Overnight, overnight Financing Rate. It's a, it's a repo rate. It has transactions, daily transactions in the overnight of $750 billion every single day. And it is now produced by the New York Fed. No, sub, no submitting banks. No expert judgment. IOSCO compliant, for those of you who are geeking out like I do and understand that that's a standard setter, and they tell you all the good characteristics of a benchmark that people are going to use. Um, so it hits all of those wonderful things, right? Which is really, really good. But when you build a market, we have a rate. We gotta now make this, and when the rate was born April 3rd. So the new standard, ISO compliant, you also heard Sandy O'Connor uh, stated that uh, this has been in conjunction with the CFTC, the Fed, uh, and some other organizations to come up with this rate. So in order to move away from the old rate, we need a new way to calculate this. Jimmy Carrera down here saying, end of LIBOR, transitioning to an alternative interest rate calculation for mortgages, student loans, businesses, borrowing, and other financial products. What are the risks? Well, you can watch that video, just uh, giving you a little bit more context with regards to that. And another video of Sandy O'Connor from early 2021, the transition from LIBOR to SOFOR. Listen to what she has to say. Broader economy, right? To help finance homes, to help finance college educations, to help finance auto. So that's what the whole goal is. Now, right post the financial crisis, what actually happened? Oh my goodness, the system, particularly the institutions, were not safe and sound. There were not adequate levels of capital and liquidity. So the shock absorbers of the systems were not big enough and deep enough and the quality was not enough. So where are we? Because post the financial crisis, and just to, again, lay the landscape, the, the G20 nations came together in Pittsburgh and they said, this will never happen again. And we are going to create a level of standard that every investor, borrower, participant in the world can rely upon with regard to the safety and soundness of banks and the safety and soundness, again, of those functioning markets. Right? So the Financial Stability Board, the Basel Committee, they set those standards. And then within jurisdictions around the world, in our case, here in the United States, the policymakers, the Fed, the OCC, the FDIC, the SEC, the CFTC, and a myriad of others take those international standards and implement them. 
So these governmental organizations are going to have to implement the standard. Notice, she mentions back during the financial crisis of 2008-2009, there was a liquidity problem. Well, what did not exist back in 2008 and 2009? Namely, Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, but more importantly, the one payment global currency that is going to set the standard moving forward, XRP. And of course, there is that elephant in the room, the SEC versus Ripple lawsuit, which was announced in December of 2020. Now, when the last LIBOR rate was going to be recalculated back at the end of 2021, we were still in the midst of this lawsuit and we're projected, if this case goes to trial, that we're still going to be in a lawsuit by March of 2023. And so the new LIBOR rate it's supposed to be recalculated on October 25th, 2022. Which makes me wonder though, if a settlement does come before that, are we going to see XRP influence the rate? Will we see more volume on the XRPL? Well, I mean, for many reasons, we will be seeing more volume on the XRPL once that lawsuit is settled, but will it be in time for this recalculation? And I have to mention it again, Sandy O'Connor, a Ripple board member. So where do you think this is all gonna go? I've got a good idea, but that's just my opinion. I wanna hear what you guys think. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Like the video if you like the content I'm providing. I always love hearing your comments. See you in the next one, guys.